These questions are designed to unfold and explain your teachings and are asked in the context of the teaching of, teachings of Ramana Maharshi, which reflect the ancient wisdom. First question, Ramana Maharshi proposed the fundamental question, who am I? Who are you? No difference. I have a certain um, personality, I have a certain background that gives a personal flavor to the format of the teaching. Okay. Many Western seekers are looking for enlightenment as if it is an experience. What is enlightenment? The complete marriage between the absolute and the relative. The end of the idea of personal doership is, is a definition that Ramesh gives and I, I like this definition very much. Um, because it implies the end of um, every kind of personal um, flavor to the, the, the purity of, of the Advaita teaching. As I said, there is a personal there is a personality and there is also um, a personal flavor, there is also a personal way of um, transmitting the teaching of, um, I call it, uh, you know, the inner network of different aspects of the teaching. Advaita is, is um, The essence, I call it the essence of, of everything, the essence of also of, of the teaching is the purity of the core of the teaching, but it is not the whole teaching, of course. The variety of, of being is so great that there are so many different aspects uh, and um, different forms might, you know, might uh, also focus on, on different aspects of the teachings or give different entrance gates to the same essence, to the same core. And of course my, you know, my, my form is not Indian. So um, there is uh, Western blood flowing through <laughs> my organism <clears throat> is it is it German blood? I don't actually know if you're German or American. Actually, it is German and English. Uh huh. Okay. Yes. Right. Yes. Okay. But you've mostly lived in Germany. Yes. Oh. Mm -hmm. Okay. My family was half English. Right. Mm -hmm. mm. Mm. But I mean, I feel very. Um, I feel I have access to the Western collective and to the Western, to, to Western mysticism. And um, I feel very much, you know, naturally uh, linked with what I call the Western stream of, of wisdom. I mean, of course, uh, in its essence, how can there be difference between Advaita and uh, Christian mysticism. So, um, of course, I was kind of introduced and I was also, um, I'm, I mean, I'm very thankful to the 
Indian stream of knowledge. And yet, uh, in this unfoldment, I got more and more access also to the to the Western tradition, this kind of the natural lineage of this organism, the lineage this organism was brought up in, you know? Right. Right. I think so. you published a book about Meister Eckhart? No, I didn't publish a book on oh. him yet, but I, I, I definitely am very much in touch with him and I also quote him in, in talks or, you know, Germany has a has a strong in the Middle Age. Germany had a very strong uh, mystic core in the Christian within the Christian mainstream. So, of course, when I was younger, you know, I was kind of like most people, rebellious against everything that had to do with. Christianity and with Jesus. This has completely changed. So do you feel that you bring Jesus into your teachings? Well, not the person of Jesus, <laughs> um, but definitely what Jesus stands for, and I, I definitely work also work with the Bible. All right. um, and I'm very close to um, different uh, Christian mystics. Mm. So I see my figure more like a, you know, like a melting uh, pot between uh, where actually this Eastern uh, lineage and, and the Western lineage meet and uh, create something completely new, which is not new at all, but uh, new maybe in its, in its form. Mm. Mm. I think that's very interesting. Yeah. Are there any qualifications for enlightenment? Is practice necessary? And if yes, what form do you suggest? I have a very sober and I, I, I would say even internally scientific uh, view because uh, I don't see any difference between mysticism and uh, what I call inner science. Um, so what we can, what, what history taught us is that there are very rare cases of, of, of people where for example, through accidents, through shocks, through different uh, very extreme situations, um, this what we call enlightenment, uh, this uh, final realization of, of being happened. However, you know, nobody has the um, Nobody can wait for uh, such thing to happen. I mean, I myself had, uh, so I could say that, uh, you know, grace happened through uh, an accident. I, I didn't have, uh, you know, uh, an, a realized teacher. Um, this accident uh, evoked a state of uh, clinical death. And uh, so I could say death was my first teacher and this was such a major shock for the whole system that it actually wiped out everything. So, of course, uh, you know, if, if the personal will uh, tries to imitate that and says, okay, I'm going to drive against uh, an oak tree like you did, uh, maybe the result will be uh, uh, solely injury and uh, more suffering rather than uh, enlightenment. So mm -hmm. this is nothing that uh, the eye it's can not do. It's a practice that you would suggest. I wouldn't uh, suggest this practice. 
<laughs> you have some milder practices, maybe. <laughs> it's not a practice we can rely on, right. you know. Right. So one one state of clinical death among thousands or a million could maybe evoke this no state of mind. But uh, I definitely. Uh, suggest the the path of uh, of sadhana you know i'm I, i'm saying to people that um, do whatever has to be done and uh, do the work that has to be done um, i might call it the homework everybody has to do this homework and uh, you know, Papaji said the, the same. Or no, I think it was it was Ramana who who once said that you know that that people who who don't have to do the work uh, in this lifetime that they had already done it uh, in other times. However, um, everybody has to do his work. Mm-hmm. So Western sadhana. I call it inner work, and um, there is no absolute definition to what has to be done. Um, the work I do with people um, relies on experience, uh, own experience, and own understanding of the functioning of what gives people what is responsible in people for illusion and this is definitely the mind so it makes sense to um, to trace you know the mind and to to see who is who is this mind what we call mind you know, so this is definitely also what I call a, a Western contribution to the um, to wisdom in general, and um, the knowledge of the mind, and especially the knowledge on the subconsciousness, is. To my understanding, for Western for Western people, much more uh, important than to for Eastern, uh, mm. you know, students. Mm. I spent some time with Osho, and uh, they had a very full-on program of, of groups doing this kind of inner work. But actually, for Indian people, Osho used to say, "Oh, you don't need to do that." Yes, and Papaji was much more saying, well, do self-inquiry, ask yourself this question, who am I? Ask it once, ask it right, and then you're free. So somehow there was not any suggestion towards Indian people anyway that they would need to do this practice. Well, Nisikadatta, for example, said, uh, you know, that in order to give an answer to this question, who am I? Uh, you should first answer the question, who am I not? Right. So, um, definitely without um, a full understanding of who am I not, who, I, who, who I'm not, right. uh, how can this question, who am I, be finally answered? Ramana was also uh, brought up in the Indian stream, not in the Western stream. And um, I see many people who, Westerners of course, who go to India and who get certain insights on Advaita on certain levels, but the insights are definitely limited. Um, the knowledge of, to, of the mind is, to my understanding, a, a, a very important. Uh, contribution to this, to the unfoldment of the whole for Westerners. Right, right. I mean, recently I've become personally interested in the Enneagram and I advertise it as 
know who you're not. So and somehow it fits. For me, it's been fitting more and more with what you're just saying. Maybe you could say something about the Enneagram because I think you, you also use the Enneagram. Well, the Enneagram is definitely uh, presenting uh, valuable answers or ver valuable insights on the subconsciousness and on the whole structure of, of, of mind that you're not, the adoption of the mind is, 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 is put together by, you know, by, by history. And the mind has, of course, um, collective roots. The mind is not as personal as it seems. I mean, the whole idea of an I is not as personal as it seems. Um, but the Enneagram also shows kind of, uh, you know, the um, natural qualities of this being. And these natural qualities differ. They are not, not every being has the same natural uh, qualities. Let's say the, the, the diamond, the, the, the light that is, is uh, you know, um, shining on this diamond is being reflected in different ways. So with one person, it might seem more greenish and with another person might seem more yellowish. So these are different, uh, you know, different virtues, different qualities, essential qualities. Of course, from an absolute point of view, this is still what you're not. But I think some Advaita teachers call this level the primary illusion. You know, it's like the Leela itself, God's play, has natural ways of appearances that show up when the, the mind, the false eye, is getting out of the way. Mm. So, for example, the, the archetype of the holy uh, which might shine through in a natural way through different organisms will never be the same as, you know, the archetype of the hero or the, the philosopher. So this organism is working in a different archetypical way than your organism, for example. You know, and of course the problem with the idea of enlightenment is that, that people have uh, certain ideas of how enlightenment shows. And of course, Westerners, you know, when we look at the <clears throat> collective coloring of the idea of enlightenment, Westerners have, um, of course, in their minds, the um, archetype of, of, of the holy. And in Christian mysticism, this is an, a very important archetype that has been manifesting. And then they link certain um, attributes to this archetype of the holy, but enlightenment is much more, you know, undefinable. It cannot be, it's unpredictable. Yeah, I mean, I would have to say that in choosing this project, you know, to go and interview, um, and now I've interviewed about 20, I would call them awakened people. And um, of course, everyone has a different flavor from the other. There's no archetypal enlightened person that I could even suggest to somebody. Yes, I'm just saying that, of course, people have, of course, an idea about this concept and it's good and valuable to look into the collective coloring that, that happens. And I'm saying to Westerners, uh, no matter whether you define yourself to be Christian or not, you're Christian anyway, you know? Mm -hmm. You left the church, it doesn't matter. 
Uh, your mind has at least 2,000 years of Christian coloring behind it. So this is really what, what the, the power of, of misunderstanding is about, you know. It's not about one personal life. It has been accumulated through thousands of years. And people underestimate, uh, of course, the power of this collective history. Um, yeah, I mean, as you speak, I can also um, see inside the effect, you know, that, that in, I went, I don't know, 30 years ago to India, and now somehow I'm a messenger for the Indian um, advisor. But actually, when you start to speak about, um, you know, the mysticism of, of the West, I can also see inside there is this this part which hasn't been given much space actually. Yes, yes. So actually what you're saying is touching me personally and it's very nice. Mm -hmm. You know, this this access to the Western collective roots in my case happened quite naturally. I wasn't, uh, I mean, there is no concept of, you know, uh, what comes to me or what has to come to me, what shouldn't come to me. And um, I think this is a, you know, a present, the, the present of a Western teacher is that a Western teacher can teach Western people much better than anybody else. I think that some Indian teachers, they, they, they don't, from an absolute point of view, it's all the same. But in the teaching, there is, it's not only about the absolute. It's about, you know, what I call the marriage between the absolute and the relative. So Advaita is not really interested in that. Um, but I, I am, more and more. Mm. And, um, an Indian form of an Advaita teacher cannot teach Western people in the same way as a Western form. This is quite natural. I would never say that I could teach Indian people in the same way an Indian teacher could. Mm. You know, but some Indian teachers, they don't see this limit mm. on the relative level. Mm. Although, having said that, it seems that um, Papaji had a tremendous influence on many Western people who since have become teachers. So, I guess, you know, the biggest nursery for the present Western teachers has come through this influence from Papaji, who is, of course, Indian. This is right. I mean, the the difference in the modern age between the, you know, when we look at the reality of the uh, spiritual Eastern collective and the spiritual Western collective is definitely that um, what I call the, you know, the, the, uns the invisible spiritual matrix uh, is still more um, vivid and sane and, and visible in, in the Eastern hemisphere. It, is, it has been uh, very much destroyed in our hemisphere. So this is uh, definitely a great advantage in, in Eastern cultures. And India is in a very sp specific way uh, I mean, kind of the cradle of spirituality on earth. So India is something special. It's not just one country. Mm -hmm. So it's, 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 it's a source. I mean, you know, it's... Yeah, I mean, personally, I, I feel it like that. Just to spend time on, on, on the land there something happens somehow. Yes. So that's what I'm saying. That's why it's natural that, you know, the, 
the, the major uh, impulses, they, they come from India mm. to Europe, to the States, uh, to Australia and the, the Western world in general, and not vice versa. Although this doesn't mean that uh, <laughs> the Indian collective could not learn, of course, from what I called the Western contribution, which is very valuable at also, you know? Because mm. of course the minds of what Indian people, they work different, but it doesn't mean that they, the knowledge about the mind is completely unnecessary for anybody, for, for everybody. Yeah, about a year ago, uh, an Indian book publisher wanted to uh, organize a tour through India where I would give meetings to the middle class. And I was completely shocked because I thought, well, why would they come and listen to somebody like me? And he said, well, actually, the middle class have lost roots also with this collective in India. Mm -hmm. Yes. So oh, they yes. have become quite like Western people in a way. Yes. I mean, <coughs> I mean, this is this is something that we can observe, you know, in the whole world of the modern age, that the whole world is becoming more and more westernized. Um, mm. This is a stream that does not come from spirituality directly. It comes from a mundane level. It comes from economy. Um, this is like in, you know, an overlayer of 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 um, well, the whole loss of, of of spirituality that has been transferred into um, you know economy and um, technological thing materialism materialism mm -hmm. actually yes. Mm -hmm. But um, what I just said recently in an interview is that this whole, let's call it materialization, although this is not quite the right term, but, but this stream of materialism that, that kind of starts, um, you know, covering the whole world, um, this is in a concealed way interesting to see that this is again Christianism um, trying to, um, you know, propagate itself, propagate itself, take over. Mm. Um, I mean, it's interesting to see these forces because, of course, the United States are a big, uh, in, have a large impact on, impact on the whole mm. on this stream. And of course, I mean, as you know, the uh, government of the United States uh, is, is very much uh, penetrated by fundamental Christian powers. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's interesting to see how Christianity, through this, let's say, uh, deviation, you know, mm -hmm. finds another way to, uh, you mm -hmm. know, to cover Mm -hmm. the world and to work as, as missionaries in a, in, a, in a very different way. I think most people are not even aware of that. Mm. Yeah, I think you're right. Mm. Mm. Um, <clears throat> Ramana said self-inquiry is the most direct route to realizing the self. What do you say about self-inquiry? and how to conduct self-inquiry. You know, the concept I use, I, I differentiate between what I call small self-inquiry and great self-inquiry. Ramana's self-inquiry in its core is what I call the great self-inquiry, um, the inner work, um, the Western sadhana, which is necessary to, to um, penetrate the illusions of mind and to um, allow 
every subconsciousness to uh, actually surface into consciousness. Um, this is what I call small self-inquiry. So you could say small inquiry is, is definitely the inquiry into what you're not. Call it a preparation. Call it uh, unveiling so that, you know, the sky is, is clear and um, this question, who am I? Uh, has no limits and can just pop up and unfold into uh, wholeness, into everything. It doesn't, you know, hit any limits. Um, every subconscious layer of mind is a limit. And sometimes, as I said at the beginning, you know, in very rare cases, it is definitely possible that this question just penetrates every layer of um, illusion, of dust that has settled internally and goes right through into through everything so yes so this finally leads to um, a contra contradictory approach because let me explain while I you know do the work uh, whatever the sadhana is, while I work on something that is not, it doesn't mean that, you know, in the next moment I shouldn't postpone the question, who am I? I mean, I'm, I'm open for this question in any moment, any given moment. And at the same time, you know, I do my work. So this is uh, a contradictory approach. Because people understand, many people who have gotten in touch with Advaita, they have not realized what I call, you know, the paradox path. And they still believe that this is, an, a, con, uh, this is a contradiction in itself. This does not go together. Um, Mm. Yeah, I mean, I, <clears throat> somehow now that we've been talking for some time, I can start to get a sense for your approach. Um, but having spent a long time with Papaji, he somehow um, hardly ever would go into what you're calling, you know, the, the inner work or the illusion. Yeah? He, his whole thing was always just to cut right through that. And somehow he had enough energy or... or perception or power, I'm not quite sure exactly how it worked, grace maybe is the right word, um, that he was really successful for that. Well, you know, I have to say after, after having observed people and even teachers who came from Papaji after, for, for years after this happened, I can say that Papaji was a great and extreme door opener. But I can, I can tell you that people who couldn't find the mind while sitting in the living room in Lucknow in 1992, I can assure you that the mind stroked back. And um, great openings where people thought this is enlightenment happened. But this was not necessarily the total destruction of uh, the power of mind as a separate entity. This was not the complete understanding of mind or the 
destruction of subconsciousness. Uh, this was a great opening that lasted for a while, but which was still limited. And I can say that, you know, uh, I mean, um, Andrew Cohen went through a disillusionment, but he, of course, drew the false conclusions. But it is definitely true that um, Papaji had, through Papaji, this power came. It is definitely not true to my observation that this was final enlightenment for many people. You know, it was a time and a space where great openings happened. Mm -hmm. But I'm not going for great openings anymore, really. I, I, I realize that you have to cook with water, if you know what I mean. There are some rare times and spaces where you can cook with champagne. But actually, you have to cook with water. And to really um, trace, as I said, the mind, you really need, you need certain qualities like discipline, uh, certain radical qualities that, that this organism has to learn. Because otherwise, um, great openings of the sky will only be temporary. You know, and so many people thought, wow, this is, this is it. I, yes, there is no mind, you know? And then, you know, the mind is, I compare the mind with radioactivity. It is not visible. You cannot feel it, you cannot grasp it. Where is it? Of course, when you look at it, it's gone, you know? But where does it come back from? It's strange that it suddenly kind of sneaks back, you know? It comes from nowhere. And uh, I have observed this in many, many cases and for many years, and people have a naive, they, they underestimate the mind, you know? It's, you know I mean, I, I would say um, that in a way what you're talking about now is one of the keys, yeah? That many people have a, a large opening, a glimpse, um, but after going back to their family or back to their work situation, just back to living in the West maybe, or even coming out of a sat some weekend intensive in the West and going home or um, after a few days, as you say, the mind just creeps back somehow. It could be after a few days, it could be after a few weeks, it could be after a few years. What I'm saying is only that, you know, that the, the knowledge of the mind is like a fundament. And uh, so when this opening happens, uh, if, if there is not the inner wisdom about this and the inner maturity, then it's as if this vessel cannot, you know, is not prepared for, for this. So the mind is, is kind of obliged to strike back. And your approach for preparing the vessel is what you call the inner work. Well, I, I tell people, you know, you have to know your opponent. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't know your opponent, um, the fight might be over for a while, but you don't know from where the opponent comes back. And never underestimate your opponent. The mind is much stronger and much powerful than you can grasp. And the mind hides um, behind masks of enlightenment, behind the, the mind hides be behind masks of the holy. The mind can imitate every kind of knowledge or wisdom. So, you know, 
what kind of opponent is this? Just, I, mean, I tell people, just imagine, you know, that this mind is having billions of people uh, is owning million, billions of people, you know? So you have to have the respect and, as I say, certain qualities and finally knowledge of this power so that this mind can really become an ally and can integrate itself into what Ramesh calls the body-mind organism, you know, as a servant of everything. But the mind, to begin with, never wants to be a servant. The mind wants to take over power, wants to sit on the throne. So, of course, the tendency will be, if you have, you know, a large opening, then the mind will come and say, it's mine. My, you know, my enlightenment, my opening, and let, let me do something with it now. Let me be a great teacher, or let me tell people where, you know, how it goes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, when Ramana was asked, when will the realization of the self be gained? He replied, when the world, which is what is seen, has been removed, there will be realization of the self, which is the seer. What is the true understanding of the world and how to remove the world? Well, what Ramana meant when he used the term world, he meant the mind, because the world and the mind, to begin with, are just two words for the same. Um, when the mind is removed, the world collapses, and the fall into the absolute which is also the fall into the unknown, happens naturally. Then the world comes back, which is not the mind, because of course there is also something that we can call world, which is not the mind, you know, which is what I called at the beginning the, the primary illusion, not the secondary illusion, which is the the suchness of a tree, the suchness of everything that, that appears. And there is no suffering in the suchness of whatever is. The mind has to be removed and quote again Ramesh, because I, I like this definition, the complete sense of uh, personal doership, which is always the consequence of the I thought claiming to be uh, the doer or the thinker or, you know, It has been suggested that the mind must be destroyed for liberation to occur. Do you have a mind? How to destroy the mind? Well, yes, of course I have a mind. I mean, this, <laughs> you know, there is definitely a misunderstanding about the destruction of mind. Um, of course, you know, you. I have discussions with, uh, you know, philosoph Western philosophers and or psychologists, and then they say, you know, but this is ridiculous. We stuck destruction of the mind. You couldn't function without a mind. I mean, if somebody called you by your name and you wouldn't, you know, had no absolutely no relationship with this name, how would how would this work? You know. 
So there is a grain of truth in this, and of course there's also um, misunderstanding and arrogance in this idea of, of, of some psychologists. But the grain of truth is that, of course, the mind cannot be destroyed in its, in its essence. The mind can be destroyed and has to be destroyed in its, let's call it, you know, overlayer, its idea of being a separate entity uh, that can, has the power to do something separately, uh, to affect uh, the world, other people or itself as a separate entity. So this is kind of um, this is, uh, you know, the result of a, a split, a split within the mind. Uh, when this original split merges, the mind doesn't reflect itself anymore. The mind is just a, mm, a servant. Uh, within unity or within, in even better words, Advaita. Um, the mind is responsible, Ramesh calls, calls it the working mind. This is also a very important differentiation, which makes clear that the mind has not to be destroyed. Thinking mind has to be destroyed. The working mind is not only important, it is absolutely essential for this body-mind organism to work. When the working mind uh, doesn't, is, is, is dead, this organism is dead. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So of course I have a mind, mm -hmm. you know, but I don't have a personal mind that has the idea of being personal, of being separate, of being somebody. But I, this organism definitely needs a mind. And the mind is, is great. I mean, the, the essence of mind is pure intelligence. Um, I was just going to say that um, um, every single meeting of these interviews has, has been somehow um, particular. So, for example, uh, you mentioned Ramesh several times. I've interviewed him for the, for the Indian book. But there's one Indian man called Adja. I don't know if you've heard of Adja. But... Yes, I've heard of him. He, he once gave an interview in uh, What is Enlightenment? That's right, with Andrew Cohen, yeah. So we've been visiting him for the last four years um, and having satsangs with him every, every year. He just left his body just a couple of months ago when he was just over 90. And we were there maybe 10 days before he left his body. We had two big meetings with him. And everybody could feel, sense, that here was an extraordinary person who was almost not a person. He, his, um, what was left of the personal seemed to be so little that he was barely, you know, it, it felt like there was this pure vessel or something. It was quite extraordinary. And the people who lived around him, a small group who lived around him, they told us that um, if, for example, when the Iraqi war started, for example, he would disappear into his bathroom for three or four days. And, and it felt like, um, in a sense, his organism was, was taken over by the energies of the planet or something like this. I, I can't mm. explain it very well. Um, but out of all these people I met, I would have to say that here was somebody um, hardly present, you know, hardly personal. 
I, I know what you mean, although I, I see it a little bit differently. Uh, I see another aspect, you know, when this, when this body ages, um, it goes in a way through a process of dematerialization. And um, my body uh, went through this process after the accident. No, well, through the accident. And then after the accident, went through a process of rematerialization. Now my body feels quite, I mean, there is Shakti, there is, uh, you know, it is not, the body itself is not transparent at all. But when the body ages, there is like a natural, everything becomes more subtle. The, 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 f the face of death shines through, but not as a horror mask, but in its subtlety and its shining, subtle love energy, you know? Yeah, I think that was very much there when we met Adam yes, recently. Yes, because this is the same what the people meet when they meet the form of Ramesh, you know? Although the same shining through, very subtle, it's almost as if you could see through the skin into the bones, you know? But this, this organism here is, is in a different, definitely different state. So there is, in a sense, more personality, more, you know. <laughs> what about the tendencies of the mind? Must these be removed before self-realization can become permanent? How to remove the tendencies? Well, you know, in a sense, I already answered this question. The, this linear understanding that, you know, First there is preparation, then there is maturity, and then enlightenment can happen. <laughs> this is an understanding of linear thinking which, which is just not true. Uh, it's too one-dimensional. Therefore I said, uh, we have to um, deal with a paradox, a, a, a paradox approach. And this, this means that uh, I could, uh, you know, explain it this way. Um, do the work on the latent tendencies of mind. Do the work, the prayers, the, whatever, the meditation, whatever has to be done. And in the same moment, be open to, to realize truth. You know, while you deal with untruth, be open to realize truth, to realize the absolute. And this is the same way I work with people. I mean, I, I do, in a sense, contradictory acts, you know, because in, in the, the, the meetings, which I call darshans. Of course, these meetings are directly and pointing to the absolute. But at the same time, you know, I I work with people. I I mean, I, I founded uh, a school ten years ago called the Mystery School, where I work with people on using metaphysical wisdom of the ages, um, secret knowledge and not secret knowledge, <laughs> um, where we do sadhana on the different uh, levels of this organism, physically, emotionally, and mentally, you know? And this is really in what I call the, the integrated uh, approach that uh, refers to every uh, level in the relative and of course to the absolute. So it's not that simple, you know, that of course the misunderstanding is some people say we have to prepare ourselves and it's going to happen in the future when I'm mature enough. 
other people who have the same linear thinking, but just on the opposite way, who have misunderstood Advaita, claim every preparation is senseless, don't do anything, don't do your work, just sit there and know who you are. So this is just the opposite direction of the same linear misunderstanding and not the full realization of a paradoxity that cannot be solved with the thinking mind. You know? Yeah, I like that very much. Are there any stages of enlightenment? What are these? How to attain each stage? You know, stages, talking about stages of, of enlightenment and concepts of mind. How can there be stages of enlightenment? Of course, there can be stages of insights, which we could call relative insights, temporary insights, uh, which happen on the inner path. But I would not call these levels of enlightenment, you know, I would call these insights or glimpses or relative openings, but enlightenment is enlightenment. Uh, this is a term, you know, that has been diluted uh, by talking about it too much. Um, so, this concept of stages uh, has in its in its it has in itself the danger of again of you know um, finding linear ways uh, to truth, uh, which is also a typical masculine uh, idea, you know of a mind that has lost uh, is uh, female roots, which is, by the way, I mean, this is a general illness of the Western mind, you see, that uh, uh, has to do with the Christian patriarchs that have been uh, coloring the whole Christian teaching. So this is a general illness, not only in men, but also in, in Western women. You know, the thinking process is, 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 uh, is masculine, you know. So my answer is no, you know, there are no stages of enlightenment. There is enlightenment and there are relative insights which are not founded on final realization, final knowledge. And of course, I know that for people, of course, how can they differentiate, you know? You can only, only see what is on, within my level of understanding. I like what I like is I like the stages that are being shown in the, in the ten pictures of of riding the ox, for right. example. You right. know, because it, this is well, a very brilliant uh, way that has been maturing in, in hundreds of years of showing, of thousands of years of showing really the stages of the past that happen naturally. We can just observe by experiencing, and this is a scientific approach again, you know, we can just observe how they happen naturally. But the mind again wants to make a concept out of this, you know, and wants to know what is step two behind step one? 
on my way to enlightenment. And this is a great disillusionment, of course, that this, these predictable steps, you know, they don't work. Because I finally have to admit that I don't know what will be step two. You know? mm -hmm. But I can definitely rely a teacher who has the, the final understanding, who does not have a rigid concept, step one, step two, step three, stage three. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Yeah. It appears essential to meet a master and surrender to that master. Who is the master? What is the master's role? And how to recognize a true master? Well, these were many questions in one. How to realize a true master? There is a disappointing answer to this question, and that is that finally people cannot. Uh, because, as I said before, you know, you cannot really um, realize something which is no thing that is beyond uh, your capacity of perception. But also, this is not an absolute uh, answer, of course. Um, because even though people are possessed by layers of mind, there is the capacity of, you know, that this power for unknown reasons, you know, penetrates through and goes directly into the heart of, of a being. And there is beyond mind a knowledge, a realization that this is a master. Um, although there is a mind, and then although resistance and the whole, you know, scenario is going to happen, <laughs> and maybe they're even going to lose this um, this moment of of of, no, of knowing, while they then will be there with this master. However. Um, when people stay true, learn to stay true to themselves, learn to listen to their hearts and to the voice of the heart, listen to differentiate what is the voice of the heart and what is the voice of the false mind. Then, by being with this master, they, they start, you know, either falling deeper into this um, true relationship with themselves, because the master is the self, or they start realizing limitations in the teachings. They start realizing that, um, you know, the teaching is not pure. There are some ways of um, coloring or imitations of, of, of teachings as spiritual concepts. It's very difficult, you know. Masters can use the same words. They can use Advaita knowledge, but people cannot differentiate by the words. And they can also not differentiate by actions of the masters. This is something, you know, where I'm saying, for example, Andrew Cohen, he, he wrote this book, I think, together also with, with Ken, Ken Wilber. I don't know what the English version is, but it's about 
trying to find, you know, the integrity of, of spiritual masters and give certain rules, All right. for example, you know. And what I'm saying is this is really a very simplistic idea uh, to judge masters by their actions. It's not so simple. We cannot see the mind uh, by actions. The mind can imitate everything, everything. Mm -hmm. So really what we need is complete introspection and a very silent inner listening. Then we can, we might have glimpses of a true master. But the mind cannot differentiate. The mind cannot, cannot really know. I mean, you know, true masters, Zen masters. The Zen tradition is, is a much more rough tradition than the, than the Advaita tradition. I mean, Indian masters are usually have very, not all, but have often very soft personalities because the Indian collective is more like a, a soft and smooth and female collective. But you know, the Zen tradition is much more rough, much more rough. And there have been masters who have been doing very, very strange, extreme, and let's even say violent things. You know, which a moralistic mind would never call love. Never call love. You know, there's this very um, known short Zen story where, you know, where the Zen master cut off the, the tip of the small finger of of the student, and in that moment, he was enlightened. Um, You'll find a story in in this Papaji book where um, <clears throat> somebody called Satya was apparently hit by Papaji, and this little episode is described in this book. Mm -hmm. And she went into a space for many weeks after that where there was nothing happening in her mind. But when you read about it, it sounds totally shocking that. You know, he would come and hit this 50-year-old lady. Mm -hmm. Yes, and this is still relatively harmless. I mean, when you read about um, stories of Zen masters, I mean, apparently people have died, you know. These are all legends, but uh, as you know, in the legend there is always, uh, always also a grain of truth. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What is the master's role? The master is a guide and a corrective, and also a catalyst. It is true that, you know, um, of course, it, it's from an absolute point of view, it's true anyway, but people don't need personal masters or don't need the master in a, in a personal form because everything can be a master, can be the master internally or externally. But when I say the master is also the personal master is a catalyst, I'm saying that yes, <laughs> Um, processes might need hundreds of years and, you know, with the proximity of a personal master, this time is, is suddenly melting. Hundreds of years can melt into a few years or finally even into no time. I think it was a nice idea of Krishnamurti, you know, uh, to teach people to focus on the inner authority and to focus on actually the inner teacher. And there are quite a few, especially American teachers, who who are on this 
you know, this line, you know. Um, and what I can reply to this idea is, it's a nice idea, but it's not in relationship with, um, with the observation, with the natural scientific observation of um, generations of, of seekers. Uh, it, it's a nice idea, but uh, it's an idealistic idea. It's, it's, it's a calm concept that is not in touch really with reality and with observ observing reality. Fact is that um, being with the Master in personal form is the most radical, the most clear, and the most obvious way of approaching the truth internally. And it's, it's the way that works, you know, everything else um, doesn't really work for, I would say, at least 99% of the people. Mm. <clears throat> Traditionally, devotees had tremendous devotion to the Master. Please say something about devotion in the pursuit of awakening. I think devotion is very difficult for Westerners. It's not really part of their horizon. What it's not part of what the mind has learned, really. You know, and devotion is is not going together with the the collective results of the age of enlightenment that our collective has gone through because the fruit of the Age of Enlightenment is the free will. And devotion does not merge. The concept of devotion does not really merge with the idea of the free will. And with the, you know, with the idea of uh, Was this was this trinity from the you know from the French Revolution? It is a fraternité, égalité, and uh, liberté. I think is it right? I don't know. I don't right? know. It sounds good. It sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> You've got good French. Uh, fraternité, égalité, and liberté. No. Mm. So this is, you know, um, leading people to the concept of human dignity. But of course, there is the misunderstanding or the confusion between human dignity and the own will that lives in a concept of self-assertion, you know? And um, this is, of course, the power of the ego. And um, so there is, there is definitely a major, major conflict on a very, on a collective level. Uh, it's not only on the personal, it's on the collective already. So it is hard for Western, for Westerners to really learn um, about devotion, because devotion, of course, implies that uh, there is definitely something higher than um, the ownership of an I, something even higher than, than human dignity. And um, 
that this, what is higher, can show even through a personal form, this is not part of the, absolutely not part of the concept of, of Western seekers. Yes, of course, Jesus Christ, 2,000 years ago, it happened for once, you know. But after that, as you know, the Christian collective is still waking, waiting for <laughs> a new... Uh, So, um, I think to, to learn about devotion, we have to learn from, from the East. I was al always very touched by the devotion of Indian people, natural devotion, which is not, which does not require uh, inner effort. You know, but for Westerners, it needs effort. And sometimes, to tell you the truth, it also needs an, a sense of inner humiliation until they bow their heads. Um, when I say this, you can already imagine, you know, the suspicion uh, hearing this, uh, the suspicion of the Western mind who's always looking for potential abuse and, uh, <laughs> you know, just listen to these words with the ears of doubt and mistrust and, uh, you know. I think it was I think it Jesus said something like the humble will inherit the kingdom of God or something like this or to inherit the kingdom of God one needs to be humble I'm not quite sure how it was really said yes and so it touches on this devotion um, in your own teaching for example do you have some way to to go into this aspect aspects, you know, I teach some sacred movements uh, in, in the mystery school, um, which have the, the power in themselves to, um, to they, they, they touch this aspect of devotion in people. These are very, very slow movements that um, are in touch with devotional postures. Are these something you've learned from Gurdjieff? Or? Well, you know, I have had, but this is too long a story, I have had different teachers before the accident. Mm -hmm. I had um, a teacher, a Sufi teacher before, I wouldn't call him enlightened, but uh, definitely a mystic. Mm. And uh, the core of these movements came from him, but it's from tradition, of course. Mm. But of course, I, I added, well, in a natural way, uh, you know, uh, they were modified, some of them. So this is a way, but you know, uh, the, the most powerful direct way that naturally points to this aspect also is th that you uh, tell people the truth and uh, that you don't tolerate untruth. In certain moments, uh, telling people the truth is sometimes humiliating. I don't need the, uh, you know, uh, personal intention to humiliate people. Uh, it's just the, the, the emanation of, of that, which humiliates the mind in a way that the mind in that moment uh, has to confess 
that you know this was a lie, this was an illusion, this is just made up story, even if it sounded spiritual or good or awakened or whatever. So this is a moment of humiliation and a moment of humili humiliation is not a moment of suffering. It has in itself the potential for devotion. So someone who, is, has, who sees that, who takes the this, this stroke, uh, gets the flavor of devotion. Uh, someone, another person who only uses this moment for protecting themselves, for um, retreating in, back into the fortress, um, has no, doesn't uh, harvest the fruits of devotion. And devotion leads into love. And love melts everything. Mm. Seekers often have curious ideas about the enlightened state. Please describe your typical day and how you perceive the world. Well, you know, the, the typical day, I would say, is, is of absolutely no difference. The typical day is an ordinary day, just like every day. Um, Enlightenment has, of course, nothing to do with the outside world and nothing to do with appearance. Um, the perception, though, of course, is mm, very different. The perception is, I could describe it in a way that um, everything emanates from a deep inner silence. The activities on the periphery of the, the world don't have the power to meddle with this silence or to get involved in this core. There is no more possibility to, uh, you know, for involvement in, on, on the surface. Um, it, this doesn't mean that I cannot get angry. It doesn't mean that I cannot, you know, uh, have all, show all kinds of natural human states of being touched um, or even being excited or so but still there is a deep never-ending awareness of eternal silence in which the world is happening. And there is never anymore the um, connection between the, the seer and the I thought. So this is what I, what I pointed to Gangachi in one of my letters. I said to her, you know, the, the I thought is uprooted. It's not, it's as if, you know, you take the weed, pull it out of the ground, and, you know, there is no more um, life blood uh, following because the, it's uprooted, you know. And this is a major um, 
major ex experience. It doesn't mean that, you know, that the mind uh, has no more negativity, that the mind will always have negativity, even in the most uh, supreme states which are temporary, you know, because enlightenment is no state. Um, so, how can a a anything that manifests have no negativity? I mean, this is the manifestation in itself is a polar world, you know? So this idea of overcoming negativity is, is in itself, uh, it's a confusion. What is much more important than overcoming negativity is the own relation to negativity. This is what I call the, you know, the weed is uprooted and then the mind has, is still producing some negative thoughts in different moments which will then simply burn. Well, they will burn. Everything burns in consciousness. But there is no personal relationship with it any longer. So just let the, you know, let it, let the clouds that come, just pass. There is nothing you can do. There is nothing you can do. You know, don't try to be good or uh, even better. <laughs> so the last question. You've given us a profound discourse on awakening. I don't know whether it was profound. Well, I think it was profound. Personally, I found it profound. Um, when you would meet someone with a passion for awakening, what would your short advice be? You know, my advice or my being with this person would definitely, would definitely relate on the level of this passion. And um, in other words, how hot is this fire and how hot are you willing to um, let it be? Um, so I never give people the same advice, you know. The, the, the advice is only a, f a reflection of the mm. desire of the person sitting in front of me. If someone wants to have, a, you know, an advice on the relationship on his girlfriend, I might give it on this level, or I might just say, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. It's not interesting. But still, I can say that you know, if if the fire is really, really present, then um, it is going to be mirrored back in a in a different way. Um, in other words, I might seem more passionate. If, if the input is passionate, I might seem passionate. If the input is not passionate, I might not be interested. Um, this is not because I have a certain concept of how to behave. This is just the natural way of how something is reflected. Um, Is there anything you'd like to add we didn't come to? Well, I think most people are not interested. <laughs> <laughs> um, I would have to agree with you, of course. <laughs> but of course, also, also many seekers are not interested. Uh, you know, it is, it is, I just remember Gangachi once said, you know, you, 
her experience that she never knew um, some people you would never have thought, you know, that they, that suddenly, you know, they, they have breakthroughs. And other people, you know, that, well, I have to say, uh, in some way, pretend to be very, you know, uh, consequent and, and, and practicing and meditating hours a day and doing all kinds of things, having already met so many teachers have have read so many books, have a lot of knowledge, which is not knowledge from uh, which is not inner knowledge, which is just accumulated knowledge. And you you know they 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 they, they are with you, but they if you you sense that there deep underneath that there is a rock and stagnation and nothing nothing really happens you know but it is really again just another sign for the unknown you can never know you can never know but generally i have to say that there is little interest finally even among this so-called satsang movement i was never a friend of this movement you know uh, this diluted movement and it has already i mean it's it's gone down mm -hmm. it's, uh, the number of people who visit these meetings has gone down a lot and that's good of course you know but really, people who are really interested, they're also open to do the work. They're just open to do the work. And I, however, I say to people, it doesn't matter what we do together. You know, we could also drink coffee. But, you know, if we drink coffee, then we really drink coffee. I mean, in full and total presence of everything. Well, I, mean, I would conclude with the observation that that somehow we have really done this interview, it feels like. Okay. So I really thank you for that. Good. It's very profound, very beautiful. And it's very beautiful for me personally to meet you in this way. The question we're facing is, is enlightenment uh, sudden, you know, or is it a path? I mean, this is, how can this question be solved? So, um, you know, the Soto School, they pointed more on the um, kind of steps, on. yes, on the steps of the path, on the process, on the on the elevation. In the Windsor School, they pointed to the the sudden stroke, and also, I mean, Papaji was definitely, I mean, in his approach, I, I would say, uh, you know, he was more on the on this side, you know. I'm not on the on, on either side. I, I I realize that you know really the the approach is a paradox, and whoever once tries to to solve this paradox is 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 mistaken. And uh, there is no contradiction. Contradiction is of course only the result of the mind attempt to solve problem that cannot be solved between the relative and the absolute. So even my, my, my answer to people, uh, you know, if you, if you had asked me 10 years ago, I would have said the only, um, the only um, aim for people is enlightenment. 
Now I would answer in a more differentiated way. I would say, yes, uh, the true aim, uh, the true the source and the aim for people is awakening and awakening to the self, realizing the self. And um, allowing the unfoldment of the highest uh, divine human potential possible. See, this is the process in the relative. Enlightenment has nothing to do with sitting there, with sitting back and, you know, it's not an end. Enlightenment is not an end. It's not an end of a relative the process, you know. So in the school, people have to learn the, dif the, under the, the, the difference between searching and learning, you know. And when Papaji said, call off the search, people understand, call off learning. You know, this is not what he said. But Papaji's approach w w it did not, like all the Indian masters, they don't integrate so much, you know, the process of what I call human um, elevation to, to highest intelligence. And this, of course, means that the effort uh, does not end. But it is a paradox. It's as if something that is already whole is striving to the highest uh, realization or the highest uh, emanation of what is whole. It's a paradox. You know, I call this the marriage of philosophy of being with the philosophy of becoming. These are two different streams. And my understanding is that the, the highest possible, if we want to call it state, is, is this marriage and not the merging, the absolute. You know, this is not the highest possible state. And you can see it in the in the ten pictures of riding the ox, you know. First, it were only, I think, eight. I understand what you're saying. I think, I think you have a very particular way of looking at all this, actually. I haven't really met it in any other interview. Mm, really? I mean, you've got, um, yeah, some kind of very unique Western um, filter or something like a filter, you know, the way you look. And I, th I found that I found that coming through the interview several times, and I think it will make it a very nice interview, actually. Well, I believe you know that I, I see that in the in the spiritual realm, the Eastern and the Western Hemisphere, we present the two um, parts that form the great paradox. Actually, you know, that is also shown in the yin and yang symbol and in all the great uh, cosmological symbols. They, they all show the same. And um, the Eastern approach is not complete. It's not complete. Mm -hmm. The Western approach is not complete. It's not complete, you know. There has to happen, there has to be a marriage. And a marriage is a, a marriage uh, between two uh, approaches that don't seem in any way they don't they, they seem contradictory it seems that they don't cannot merge you know they cannot form one uh, they seem to exclude each other and we can only realize this unique marriage if we go beyond uh, this linear thinking approach that tries to separate and to tries to, you know, follow one or the other, you know, we might have different entrance gates, but to realize the highest, we have to give every contradictory approach, give, give every inner contradiction up and, and, and meet 
in a, a no-mind way and observe this great... We had a wonderful example of that, actually, in, uh, in this last meeting with Adja. There was an executive from Australia, a very nice woman, probably 55 years old, came and sat in front of him and had her question. I can't remember really the question, but it was like a um, perfectly nice question, and she was probably hoping for a perfectly nice answer. Um, but then actually what happened was that he challenged her and he said, you know, are you really interested in the answer to this question? Is that really your interest? And, and of course, she hadn't quite understood the trap that was about to spring. So she said, of course, yes, yes. Then he said, well, have you an airline ticket? Yes, I've got an airline ticket. Um, are you ready to tear up your airline ticket? A bit of shock. And then basically he challenged her to tear up her ticket and stay in his ashram. And then he would answer her question, mm -hmm. you see. So somehow, I don't know if that's for you a good example, but for me, that's an example where this thing happens, yeah? Because this was completely out of any possibility for her. And in the next meeting, the next day, she sat in the furthest corner, right in the back, hoping that he wouldn't notice her. But of course, it didn't work like that. So the first thing that happened was he, where's that woman, you know? <laughs> <laughs> so, I mean, I find this play is very profound in the end, yeah? And it's, I think, an example of, of what you're talking about. It brings these two streams together somehow. Thank you. All the best for your project. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm.